Since January the 6th, 2021, more than 1,000 defendants have been arrested in nearly all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Those arrested have been charged with a long list of felonies and misdemeanors, including assaulting, resisting, or impeding officers or employees of the U.S. Capitol. Over 518 individuals have already pled guilty to a number of offenses. Over 60 people have been found guilty at contested trials. A just completed Oath Keepers trial found defendants guilty of both felonies and misdemeanors. To try and understand more about the judicial trial process, we asked a juror on this recent trial to tell us her observations. Ellen, you just sat on a jury for what kind of a case? This was a federal criminal trial in U.S. District Court here in Washington. Six of the people related to the Oath Keepers who were accused of crimes on January 6th were on trial together in one, in one trial. So with, we're going to talk about lots of things that happened during this time and how you were selected, but what's your overall view this just a, two days after the decisions were made about the whole the whole experience. As a person who has never served on a jury before, other than a grand jury, but not at a trial jury, it was overwhelming to go through this with very little preparation and to have to be able to take in so much information. It was six trials in one. Some of the defendants had nothing to, almost nothing to do with the others. And to be able to figure out a way to process this and deal with it, and then the dynamics of dealing with a jury, all brand new, all with almost no preparation, like here, you're it, sit down, let's go, we're starting in five minutes. That's how much preparation we had. And I, I'm just blown away by the amount of responsibility they put on 12 random people to be the arbiters of the fate of some, some individuals. It, it just boggles my mind, you know, the amount of responsibility they put on you with no preparation. What did you decide? Do you mean the, uh, the verdicts? Yeah. We had 34 counts against six different people. Some of the counts were against all of them. Some per people were charged with one count. Some people were charged with a few. Overwhelmingly, we mostly found everyone, well, four of the defendants were found guilty of all their charges, which could have been up to seven against each of them. Um, one of the defendants was only found guilty of one charge, and then we were hung on one of his charges. And then another defendant, we, um, found guilty of two of his charges and he was cleared of a few others. It's hard to just remember this. We're, we weren't allowed to take our notes with us when we left. You know, I have a notebook full of information. So I'd say the majority were found guilty of their crimes except for two, two of them. What kind of people were among the defendants? What did you see? <sighs> I saw people who traveled here from out of state all of them are from out of state, or not from Washington, D.C., and who didn't understand very much about our city, our laws, our government. Um, as far as what, they weren't even from big cities. These, some of these were people from living on farms and rural places, most of them, who had, I think, no concept of Washington, D.C. And um, they were just, you know, just a variety of people. One was a former you know, military veteran. I mean, um, two of them are related to other um, defendants from other cases. One was a brother, uh, one was a sister of someone else who was in a different trial, and one was the wife of someone who was in a different trial. And then there was a, a married couple. And then there was a young man who um, came with his relatives, but ended up alone in the Capitol without his relatives during the insurrection. How long did the jury deliberate? Um, it was six days. We were given the case on a Friday 
30 minutes before we were about to be released, so I don't count that. After that, we, we sat for six days. Yeah. What was the hardest part of making a decision? I'd say the absolute hardest part is that everyone came to this jury with their, obviously with their own beliefs, their own lives, their own thoughts, their own experiences. And there were several people in the jury who felt they will never convict somebody because of something, despite nothing to do with any of the facts of the trial, just because of their own experiences or who they were. Um, they were bringing sympathy, sympathy to certain defendants. And the difficulty was following the law. With a group of 12 people, we had an attorney. I was able to understand a lot was going on. A few of us were able to really dig into it. We had 45 pages of, of jury instructions from the judge, 45 pages that we had to understand. And it, it, it's not written for the average public. It's, it's, it's above that. It's, it's, very, it's very legalese. And fortunately, we had a lawyer on the jury, and he was able to take a four-page description of one count and say, look at this paragraph. You know, and he, would, he was helping to guide people who you couldn't take it all in and understand what we were supposed to do. It went on and on and on. And I think the problem is you take 12 random citizens of a city or a state, and you expect them to understand law and understand legal terms and understand so much more than the I think a lot of people are able to grasp. And you have to come to a decision with these people who keep saying the same thing over and over again. You know, that's not this, because they don't know the definition of this word. It's what they assume it means. It was very challenging. <laughs> well, what was your biggest personal surprise that you did? Not what anybody else did, but <clears throat> when you made your own decisions and your own involvement in the deliberations? Well, as I've mentioned to you, this, you know, I haven't really slept for six weeks because I basically spent a lot of the times at night waking up and thinking of, this is going to be my opening argument today and this is going to be my closing argument. And often every day I walked in and I said, can I talk about this thing? And they'd say, yes. And then I basically made a speech because I would think about different ways to explain it when we weren't agreed on something. Where would you do that, by the way? Physically, where would you do that speech, your speech? Oh, at, when the jury started in the morning and we didn't know where we were starting, and I'd say, I'd like, to, I'd like to address this defendant. And I would have thought of something that hadn't been brought up before, like take this and think about this and put yourself, you know, and um, the attorney on, on the, on the um, jury and I were kind of tag teaming, but um, I felt like people can't think outside of you know, what, what they, they believe. And people weren't, some people weren't paying attention to the whole trial and didn't understand a lot of what, what, what had happened. So it was like trying to explain to people in, you know, layman's terms what we're talking about. Forget the legal stuff. This is what it means. And I, I had no idea I was able to do that, but um, I, I think it helped because there were many counts where we started out maybe one or two to 10, and we brought the other 10 along. <laughs> I told the jury, if you haven't seen the movie 12 Angry Men, which I happen to remember from last century, you gotta watch it. And I didn't really remember it, but I knew that somebody turned 10, 11 other people his way. And, you know, I think it's probably similar. <laughs> well, when you were called initially to, to have to come to the courthouse and be part of the selection process. What had been your attitude about January the 6th? <sighs> I was horrified. <laughs> I mean, I, as a, as a citizen of this city, as a citizen of this country, as someone who, you know, worked for C-SPAN for 32 years, that wasn't the main thing, but, it, it, you know, I was personally uh, you know, around the Capitol for a long time. Um, it was, I thought it was horrendous. I thought it was just horrible. That it was just, it was devastating. Did you, were you on a side? Did you think one side or the other was right or wrong? At, on January 6th? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing. You know, people to this day, 
think that the January 6th thing was not what uh, it's portrayed as being. Okay. Um, I kind of think it was bad and that the, um, you know, our capital was attacked, C policemen were attacked, people were killed, people were hurt. I, 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 that's the side I'm on. It was a really bad thing. The reason I ask you that is I, as you know, I sat, we've known each other for 32 years, worked together. It was a happenstance that I was in that court watching the trial. I had no idea that you were going to be there. Right. But as I watched the jury being selected, there were a number of jurors that acted like they knew nothing about January the 6th. They live in D.C., right. that they hadn't paid attention to any of it, that they didn't have any strong views of it. So that's why I ask you that question. So if you came in with some very strong views before it even started. Well, I came in with an open mind, though. I didn't know who the who the um, the defendants were. They could have been people just sightseeing. I didn't we I didn't know who the defendants were in the case. We weren't told anything when we were going through a week of jury selection. So I was not a you know a fan of January six, but I wanted to give these people every opportunity to prove that they not that they have to prove their innocence, but to explain why they were there. I assume they were there. Um, you know, I'm sure there are people maybe just walking through the Capitol just sightseeing, you know? I, I, I mentioned this to the jury many times in one of the key pieces of video of our defendants in a group discussing their plan prior to going in, a woman walked by with a baby carriage. I, I'll never forget that. So, you know, obviously if she was on trial, it would be like, so she's walking by with a baby carriage, you know what I mean? I had an open mind about the case. But I had, you know, feelings about January 6th. What was life like being a juror? What was, you know, I'm not talking about the substance of the case. What was the six, what were the six weeks like? Um, it was exhausting, but I was exhilarated. It was fascinating. It was one of the most interesting things that you know that probably will ever happen in my life and and it was an, such an honor to be part of it they really built us up and made us feel like important we were and it was it felt like i'm doing a service to my country i'm doing a service to this court and it was like being part of a made for tv movie but the stress <laughs> built and built and built the sleep got less and less and less and it was exhausting. You know, I also was working one weekend day every week. So I only had one day off, which clearly was not good. And you couldn't, you couldn't get away from it. Again, as I mentioned, you could not talk to anybody about what you were going through. You couldn't discuss it with anybody you knew. So you're living inside your head. The whole thing is in your head and you can't, you can't get away from it. But that's not to say I was excited to get up every day and go to court. Were you not allowed to talk to fellow jurors? Right. We could not talk about the case until it was handed to us in deliberation. So for five weeks, we had 11 people and we all got, you know, we all made friends and got close with each other. We could talk about anything in our lives in the world, but not about the most important thing that we were sharing as a group. We could not talk about it at all until they handed us the case. What about pay? Um, there was pay. If you work full-time, um, your employer could decide, you, you were being paid by your, your job, but your employer could decide whether you had to hand over the money they were giving you outside of the $7 we got for transportation. I, as now a part-time worker, was able to keep the money that they gave me. I mean, do you want to know the amount? Yeah. Oh, okay. So when you're on a, a federal jury, um, for the first 10 days, you get $50 a day plus the $7 in transportation. After 10 days, you get $60 a day plus the $7 for transportation. But I read in the fine print, after you get $600 for them, they start, they'll start taking taxes out. <laughs> and the first check didn't come for until like five weeks in. They only cut checks, checks like once a month. So that's, that's the pay. How much did you know about the defendants? In other words, there is a trial going on right now, the Proud Boys trial, and the defendants are in jail. 
Did you have any question as to whether or not the defendants were in jail in your Oath Keepers trial? I didn't know. I somehow assumed they weren't, but I, I had no idea. I mean, that wasn't told to us, so. I was in the, cr I was in the room yeah. uh, part of the time, and they weren't in jail, and therefore there were no marshals except one security marshal in the courtroom. In the other courtroom of Proud Boys, there's probably four or five marshals that are okay. in and around the defendants. Right, so I assume they weren't. You know, there were no signs that they were, so. How far away did they sit from you? I'm not good with feet, but um, the jury had, well, first of all, you have to know that there were four prosecutors plus two, like, media tech assistants in a table right in front of us. And then the six defendants had nine lawyers, and some days they had assistance to the nine lawyers. So it was, it was huge, but it's the, all the way across the room were the defendants as far as they could get them from us, the prosecutors right in front of us. But, you know, you think of a trial, you usually have a defendant and a lawyer or two. We had nine defense lawyers, six on the prosecution team, and six defendants. So it was, it was, it was a crowd of people in front of us. How much were you aware that some of the defense lawyers were paid for by the taxpayer? I never knew that until you told me that yesterday. I actually, after the trial was over and we were allowed to talk to the other jurors, said, commented to my fellow jurors, um, I can't imagine how much this is costing those defendants because I know, you know, they've been, they were probably indicted a year ago. I said, who could afford this? I had no idea how these people could do it. And then you informed me that, which I don't understand. Why is the government paying for the defense lawyers? I don't because understand. Because the defendants say they don't have any money, and therefore the government spends $164 an hour mm. per defense lawyer, and not all of them were paid by the government <clears throat> or the taxpayer. But uh, And you don't know that unless no. you ask them. And I asked them individually. Didn't get to all of them to find out. They're they're quite willing to tell you that it's it's well known among the you know the court system. So you're th you're thinking about it. The government is paying for the trial. The government's paying the judge. The government's paying the prosecution. The government's paying the defense lawyers. So the government's paying every almost everything about it. But we were all really surprised that some of the defendants had two lawyers, and we could tell one seemed to be a really seasoned you know, educated, qualified lawyer, and then there were the, these other lawyers like, you know, is that person a friend of the defendant? Who is that? Some you know? of that went on, yeah. And that's what we figured. We figured maybe they brought a hometown lawyer with them just to be, I, I didn't sense that two lawyers for a single defendant were a team, were working, to, you know, were, came from the same place, were like partners or something. So we were very confused. <laughs> go, go, go back to the, the, the outside experience. Yeah. Um, what time did you have to be at the court every day? Um, we were supposed to be there by 9.30 every morning. Um, they told us to be there at 9.15, but we knew that we were really beginning at 9.30. However, every, almost every single day it was delayed getting us in there because of our legal arguments in the court every single day. But we were technically supposed to be there at 9.30 in the morning. And then Monday through Thursday, we were supposed to be done at 5.00. On Fridays, it was half a day, so we were, we were supposed to be done by 12.30. How often did you break during a day? That was really good. Um, besides a hour-long lunch break, he broke us every, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Um, it was not just to get up and stretch your feet, but you had to clear your mind for like 15 minutes. It was really good to get up, walk out, you know, go have some coffee, whatever, just to get away from it because it was so much information. So there was morning break, lunch, and afternoon break. Who was the judge? Um, I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> my mind is going crazy right now. Um, judge Me Meta. Meta. I know, I was trying to, I, we always were concerned about how to pronounce it. It was Judge Meta, but people thought that wasn't the right way to say it, so I was just making sure I was saying it the right way. Yeah, so Judge Meta, who has been the judge on every Oath Keepers case, um, which I think is really smart. And this was the third Oath Keepers trial? This case. was the third Oath Keepers trial, but many of the defendants, as you know, you know, took pleas even way back last year. Did you have any feeling about the judge? Did you meet the judge? Did he talk to you? 
only very br I mean, as far as meeting him. Um, he, as soon as we were selected, he came to talk to us for five minutes, and then the trial started. But he was very kind. He was very personable when he met us, and then he came to thank us at the end. Very heartfelt, very emotional for what we had done. That was the only two times we were ever able to talk to him. Um, other than you might pass him in the hallway and he'd say good morning, you know, or something. That, that was the extent of the conversation. I thought he was really good. I thought he was very competent, even keeled, fair, moved it along. Um, I, I have utmost respect for him. I think he did it. He, he's a really good judge. What did you think of the defense attorneys, the nine? <laughs> mixed feelings. Um, I thought a few of them were really pretty good. <laughs> and then a few of them, we, my fellow jurors and I, we just could not believe it. They just, we didn't know why they were there. They would try to do, one person would try to do a cross-exam and just went on and on and on forever and never got anywhere. And the judge eventually cut that person off. And there was a defense attorney attorney who pulled a stunt that was just horrible, um, trying to um, force his, trying to break down his own client on the stand to prove some kind of point, and it was horrible, and jurors, including myself, were crying. Um, that was just the worst part of it, but um, I think it's a mix. I, I, I don't think it was, you know, 100% the greatest defense lawyers I've ever seen. <laughs> One of the issues before you ever came into the court as a jury, I saw when they went through the whole process of whether or not William Isaacs, who's a young man, about 24 years old. He's 21. From, <clears throat> from Florida. Right. And he is autistic. Tell us that story. And they, the, the judge and the prosecutors all went through whether or not he should be allowed to tell the jury that he has autism. That was a theme throughout most of the trial. Um, we came to find out later, or actually during the trial, the judge said something about the hearing we had about autism. So I knew there had been a hearing before the trial started about whether to allow this just by that comment from the judge. From the moment his defense attorney did his opening statement, we knew that autism was going to be everything about the defense case. and the young man who was 21 was sitting there with headphones on and so the his defense team wanted to ex explain that right away why um, why the why the headphones we didn't know that why until oh actually he probably did tell us in the opening in order to be able to f filter out the ex you know ex excess noise in the in a room and just hear someone speaking he was listening to white noise in his in his headphones and it would filter out everything except the main audio that you're hearing. Otherwise, he'd be distracted by every sound in the room. And that's what we were told. So he was wearing his headsets the entire time that um, during the trial. What frustrates us now, looking back, is that we spent two whole days of our lives learning everything you could possibly imagine about autism from two expert witnesses, one for each side. And we came to learn in our jury instructions to disregard anything about autism. Autism is not a defense in criminal, federal criminal law. And all of us are like, why did we have to go through this? Plus, they put only four of the defense, three or four of the defendants took the stand, four. William Isaacs was one of them. And it went on for a whole day watching this poor young man be basically tortured by this, um, mostly by his own defense lawyer. And it was the most traumatic part of the trial, and it meant nothing to our deliberations. We were not allowed to consider it. So I know that the judge had a hearing about it. I know there were certain rules about what they could talk about, because every time the defense lawyer kept asking a question that wasn't allowed, the judge slammed him. We talked about that, and you can't ask that. Um, and I, to this day, wonder why we had to waste two days on something that didn't matter to our decision making. What happened to the decision on William Isaacs uh, in, in the case? William Isaacs was convicted of every single charge. He was charged with more offenses than anyone. He was convicted of every single one of them. Obviously the defense 
ne try to make us sympathetic to his illness. We were very sympathetic to it. Of course we were, we were human beings. But I, I assume the judge will deal with that in sentencing. It's not our place to say, um, you didn't break this law because you are X or Y or have this illness or have this condition. That's not our place. Our place is to say whether you're guilty or not. It's the judge's job to decide how to handle it. Thank goodness that's not our job. But um, it was just a huge waste of time. I, I have a list of a lot of the charges. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Yes. What does that mean to you when you started talking about it? That was one of, one of the easier ones. I mean, did they disrupt Congress? It was like, yes, next. These kind of charges also, I must tell you, the people, some of the people in the jury did not understand what any of that meant. So we had to be like teaching people what that meant. But that was one of the easier charges for most of the defendants, not all of them. Did they disrupt Congress? Of course they did. But the big fight was, did the two people outside have anything to do with it who didn't go in the building? There was a big inside-outside fight throughout the entire deliberations. Did people outside do anything? Like, of course they did. But even though we had testimony from, you cannot believe, the, well, you probably saw a lot of them, the witnesses we had, Capitol Police, FBI, um, the architect of the Capitol's office, um, I mean, just on and on and on, uh, experts in D.C. police, experts in every single aspect of what we needed to know. And, you know, they told us if anyone was on the Capitol grounds, in the building outside, Congress could not come back into session. Yet there was this huge dispute in our jury about that. Like, that's not true. Like, it was hard. But that was, to me, very simple. Did they disrupt Congress from, from doing its work? Yes. Charges of preventing Congress from performing its duty. Wait, didn't we just see that? Well, the are two separate. Oh, you mean, <coughs> you mean uh, count three. One of them was disrupting Congress from doing its work. The other one was disrupting members of Congress from being able to do their work. So to us, one was, did Congress stop? Yes. The other one was, were there our defendants going down the Senate hall and standing outside of Speaker Pelosi's suite, making the staff have to disappear and run? And you know, Vice President Pence, who was upstairs, had to run because they were in the hallway right outside the Senate door or right outside Pelosi's. Um, sweet. Yes, they disrupted individual members of Congress and being able to fulfill their duties. That's how we looked at it. A woman named Connie Meggs was convicted. She was among the defendants. Were you aware of her husband, Kelly Meggs, had already been convicted of an Oath Keepers uh, group? I mean, he was a leader. Yes. Um, obviously, his husband's, her husband's name came up like every second in the whole trial because he was the leader of the whole group of our defendants, except for Michael Green. Um, so we knew, everyone knew of Kelly Meggs and that he was like a really high up person in the Oath Keepers um, group. I knew from before I even knew I was on this jury that someone of that name had been conv convicted. You know, I, I knew Rhodes was and I knew he was. Stuart Rhodes. Stuart Rhodes and him. I didn't know the names of every other Oath Keeper who was mentioned and, you know, 20, 25 of them were mentioned in our trial. I didn't know who any of them were. Stuart Rhodes, by the way, for those um, who remember, had a patch over his eye. He's a Yale Law graduate and was the leader of the Oath Keepers. Yep, and that his trial was the biggest trial. He was the first to be tried, and Kelly Meggs was with him. I think that's why I knew Kelly Meggs' name. He was in the same trial. And they haven't been sentenced. I don't think so. I think I read no. somewhere no. that's May. May, some of them are going to be sentenced. So nobody's been sentenced. But people who pled out have been sentenced. They could get 20 years in prison. Was that impact? Did that impact you at all when you're talking among your jurists? We didn't know what the sentences could be, nor did the judge allow us to consider the fact of what the sentences could be. In fact, we didn't even know while we're deliberating that. Um, the sixth count was a misdemeanor. We didn't even know that. You know, we, we didn't know this will carry more jail time than that. But that wasn't explained to us, nor were we allowed to consider that. Were you allowed to look it up when you were home at night? No, 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 no. We couldn't do any research. We were told, do no, you cannot do any research about anything. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it was kind of, we could not come in and say, I found out last night that this charge has, that 
that was not that would not have been allowed. Anybody explain to you why that was the case? They wanted us just to consider the evidence and the crime, not like the repercussions for this human being of what they could get sentenced to, and is that too much? I could understand that. Did you find during your personal conversations with the other jurors that they had gone home and looked up things? Yeah, I know at one point when people were arguing to clear somebody that, you know, if, we, if we're not 100% sure, how could we subject this person to a possible 20-year um, sentence? It, it was said once. I think some of us aware, were aware of it, but I couldn't, I didn't know, you know, there were like six felonies and one misdemeanor in our, in our case. I, I didn't know this one is six, 20 years, this one's 10, this is five. I just know these are felonies, these are really bad. You know, I, but I thought they were all felonies. I didn't know one of them was even a misdemeanor, as I said. There's a 72-year-old man named Benny and his <laughs> wife, Sandra. Yes. She's 63, I believe. What happened to them? They're from near Cincinnati, <laughs> Ohio. It is like the tragedy, besides William Isaacs, the, the young man with autism. I mean, the Parkers, it's, it's just such a heartbreaking story, <laughs> in a way. Um, I don't know how far you want me to go with this, but um, he wanted to be in, he was a former, um, not National Guard, like Ohio State Guard, what's it called? It's not a militia. Was it, a, is there a militia in Ohio? He could have been in the reserve force. Yeah, something like that. He wasn't a veteran of like, yeah. you know, the, the military, but he was in some kind of Ohio militia or something and wanted to rejoin it. And then he hooked up with this, he met at, at a, 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 some kind of a protest rally that people were there with, with guns because they're allowed, it's allowed in that state. He met this woman, Jessica, who they became friends with. Jessica brought them to D.C. And um, they were from, they have, there was a lot of evidence about Benny. We had almost more evidence about him than, than anything um, in the case. He was, he and his wife were both very, as a lot of defendants were very upset with the outcome of the election and wanted to do something. And they said they wanted to fight, but I don't think they meant that literally at first. And were very excited about coming to, to the January 6th Stop the Steal rally that President Trump had called people to come to come for. And were just new to the Oath Keepers, but they understood the Oath Keepers and they were at, they asked what to wear, can we bring our weapons, can we bring, you know, it was, they were getting very involved in it, they traveled here, and all of the defendants, uh, we believe, initially came to see President Trump do his ellipse event, the Stop the Steal rally, and we believe somewhere during that whole day, they suddenly were called to arms by Stuart Rose because Pence didn't do what he was supposed to do and started walking towards the Capitol. And Benny um, is one of the two defendants that didn't go inside because he has very severe arthritis. He said this on the stand, and his knees hurt so badly from that walk from the ellipse to the Capitol, which is no, no short walk. He just couldn't make it up the stairs, but his wife, I'm sure we'll think about this for the rest of her life, said, I really want to go in. He goes, oh, she's so stubborn. You know, he said, just go, just go. And therefore, he sent her in with the substack, <laughs> and he stayed outside. So this became one of the biggest controversies in the whole trial. Benny didn't go in, how could he be guilty? Benny turns around outside and does an interview with a foreign journalist that I think just sealed his fate. And he was boasting about this is our capital, this is our building, we own this. And then the reporter asks him the fateful question, do you think it's illegal what they're doing inside Congress? And he used the word Congress, not the Capitol, not the building, he said the word Congress. And Benny said, yeah, it probably is, but there's so many of us, what could, what could they possibly do to us? And then he goes on and says, yeah, there could be a, we, we, we could have a civil war and we are prepared to, to bring arms. And there was a, the big, one of the biggest fights of the whole, in the whole jury, was that Benny didn't go, go inside. So all, he should only be convicted of trespassing. I remember his testimony when the prosecutors pulled out of him information about his guns. Yes. 
He said, and you know, you remember this. He said he always carried a forty-five gun, right. and he brought an AR-15 <laughs> with him, but didn't bring it to the Capitol. What was your reaction when you heard that? Oh my God! This again, the jury was so divided on this. This man, just as you said, and we saw the gun, the big long gun, in in the courtroom. They br the FBI brought it so that we could see it. This man, think about it, is planning a trip to Washington to go see the President of the United States, and he's texting back and forth with this woman, Jessica. Um, is it okay if we, I bring arms? And she's like, let me check. And she says, yeah, sure, bring whatever you want. And this is before he even know that, knew that, I don't think he knew that you can't bring guns to D.C., and I don't think he knew that he was going for some alleged protection of dignitaries detail, which was pretty much BS. And he brings his normal pistol and his long gun on the way, but they happen to spend the night in Winchester, Virginia, at somebody's house who was involved with the Oath Keepers. And then he f I think he found out that you can't bring guns into Washington, D.C., so he left it there. And a lot of us saw that this is part of, you know, possibly the conspiracy beginning, and then others are like, but he left it an hour away. But yet he's standing here telling a journalist, yeah, we're prepared to have a civil war, and we'll even bring our weapons. And he was le he left his house to head to Washington to go to some place where the president of the United States is speaking, and he brought two guns. I mean, it says a lot to how, me. How <laughs> sympathetic were these two characters? I, maybe it's not fair to call them characters. Benny <laughs> and Sandra, because they were there all the time in the courtroom. They're yeah. older looking. Right. They have white hair. Yes. Very quiet. They don't, they don't talk much. There was a lot of sympathy. Um, we feel like they stumbled into something. They didn't know what they were getting into, but here's the most amazing thing. We, we had over 600 pieces of evidence, texts and tweets and videos and, and, and um, pictures to go through, but here's something that is just amazing. After, after the event, their little trip to Washington, they go home. We have texts back and forth with them and Jessica, who was their you know ringleader to get them there. And Benny is like, all happy and chipper in these, these, this communication. And he's like, we're still on cloud nine. How are you guys doing? Let's get together with drinks. He was like, so happy. This is two days after the six, okay? Back and forth with Jessica, oh, really good. It was great seeing you again at the bar. Everybody's happy, happy, happy. Then we realized they probably found out people are starting to get arrested. <laughs> About four days later, he sends out his final text to Jessica saying, what did you get my wife into inside that Capitol? And that was the last thing. So the, he literally said they were on cloud nine. When they got home, it wasn't even like, you know, Sandy is in the Capitol, in this stack, dressed like the military, and in a, 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 just getting through the Capitol door Policemen are hurt, the door is broken, it's a mob scene, they're pushing in, like, and then they get inside and they're in the rotunda, they're all looking around, half the group goes through the Senate, half the group goes towards the Speaker's suite in the House side, and they continue. Sandy is in the group, still there's four of them from our defendants, pushing into a hallway where these armed officers are trying to protect the Senate door, and it was a horrible standout off the, the, the cops are there in riot gear, and our defendants are continuing towards the Senate until one of the officers sprayed pepper spray at the group, and they retreated. You go through that, I mean, just the pandemonium on the Capitol grounds to begin with going in, and you go home, and two days later, you still don't know you've done anything wrong. It just, I, I just can't grasp my, my head around it. As we had a Capitol Hill police lieutenant, I think was her rank, or captain, who was in charge of like 200 people that day, and she was specifically in charge of the pipe bomb thingies that were going off at the DNC and RNC, and what she said to us, which uh, I'll never forget hearing, she said, if you walked on those Capitol grounds and you smelled all the tear gas and pepper spray and you saw people scaling the walls and you heard the noise and you saw damaged windows and people storming the door, she says, what about that would not make you think that this is a riot? She says, if you went to a concert and heard that, you would turn around and leave. Yet these people, some of them, 
went into the building. It wasn't just they're on the ground saying, oh my God, I'm getting out of here, as you would think most rational people would do. They went inside. And yet, it took us six days to come up with, with, with verdicts. What were people saying on the jury about Benny and Sandra that took you so long? Sandra was easy. Anyone who went in, our jury, our jury, some of them did not understand what circumstantial evidence was. They had to see it, and there had to be video, or there had to be transcripts of phone calls. It's like, can you imagine the trials in yesteryear when there was no internet, how people ever got convicted? We had so much information, but unless they saw it, they didn't believe it. It was very easy with the people that went in. We had video of every single thing they did. Here's when they, they, they harmed the door. Here's when they got in the face of the police. Here's when, you know, it was like every single thing. Here's when they were blocking Pelosi's office. Every single charge. We had video. So it wasn't that hard to get through the people that went inside. It was the outside. And there were people on the jury who felt Benny didn't know what was going on. Benny stayed outside. And they kept saying, this is my favorite. We don't know that the only reason he didn't go in is because his knees hurts. And I would say, he was on the stand. And he was asked, why didn't you go in? And he said, because I have arthritis and my knees hurt. Don't you think if he had a better explanation, like, oh my god, I'm not going in there. That's crazy. I don't want to break the law. I'm not going to go fight with the police. I'm not going to go bust up the Capitol. He would have told us. It would have cleared him. But he, was, he testified that the reason he didn't go in is because his knees hurt. But they felt, oh, there were probably other reasons he just didn't tell us. He also sent his wife in. It wasn't like, you know, wife, let's get out of here. Did it matter that he said his wife was going in because of her ability to help uh, if somebody was hurt medically? We didn't buy that for a second. She walked past two police officers, one of who testified in our trial, who were being berated by this crowd. You know, things were being grabbed and pushed. She didn't stop to help him with her Band-Aids, which is what she was carrying, I believe. She had like rolls of like tape and Band-Aids. That's what she brought. She didn't offer them a Band-Aid. She kept going. There were people inside who, who they saw, police officers surrounded by mobs, police officers in trouble. She didn't go help them. The only person she gave a tiny bit of assistance to was when um, William Isaacs got pepper sprayed and he couldn't see he sat on a bench, and we have a picture of her with her arm on him. So she helped him. Um, Did it matter to you that Benny testified as a witness, but she did not? We think Benny did so much harm by testifying. The three of the defendants shouldn't have testified. Well, two. Two shouldn't. Two who did, no, actually. I'll take that back. Three did harm to themselves by testifying. Only Michael Green did a really good job. Which three? William Isaacs proved to me that he is an intelligent person capable of answering a question and is articulate by taking the stand. Even though his defense attorney tried to get him to fall apart by yelling at him and not letting him wear his headsets that he wanted to wear so badly and put him right in front of him and said, you can't wear those. He was torturing his his client to get us to feel sympathy, but I found a very articulate, intelligent young man on that stand. He, that did him no good. Um, Benny did the worst. Benny answered a question when he was asked, when did you know that your group was going in the Capitol? Oh, I knew before we got there. He knew when he was walking down Constitution Avenue. He just not only confessed, but he condemned everybody else. There, that was, there was the conspiracy. And then Benny doesn't give us a better reason for not going in than his knees hurt. In other words, if his knees didn't hurt, he would have gone in. Who was the third one that shouldn't have testified? Oh, Connie Meggs. Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Meggs' wife. Wife, Connie Meggs. Our, my fellow jurors, who we have spoken a lot since the trial, felt that she was absolutely the worst on the stand. Why? She's married to one of, she's married to the Florida leader of the Oath Keepers, who was in charge of our group who went in, right, and was very close to Ro Stuart Rhodes and who was charged with the same thing Stuart Rhodes was. She was there with him and other Oath Keeper events prior to this in full Oath Keeper gear. Everything said it. She had everything she needed. 
She claims she didn't know she was a member. She never joined. She didn't know what they were doing. She couldn't shoot a gun. There's actual f video, uh, photos we have of her shooting a gun because she has arthritis. This arthritis was also a theme in this, this trial. She had no idea what was going on, and she's a, uh, uh, you know, she's a, short, a lot shorter than her husband, I should say. She couldn't see what was happening because she was right behind him going into the Capitol. She couldn't see anything. And they did show photos of that. Yes, but I think even if a tall person's in front of you, you're surrounded by a riot. You're going up the stairs. You're surrounded by a riot. The Capitol doors have been broken in. There are police officers over here suffering. And, she, and a few of, of the, the women in our group who went in claims they were so, you know, that they were being pushed in. And she said she was lifted off her feet. But when we studied the videos and the photos, as they're approaching the Capitol door, you know, there's like a, a platform, a landing. You could have just walked to the side. Even if you decided you were going in and you got up to that top step and you saw what was in front of you, all of this, Connie Meggs you could have left. <laughs> cried on the witness stand. She cried also while sitting at her defense table a lot. And what impact did that have on the jurors? Nothing. She was crying during the trial also. I felt bad. I mean, there were times in that trial I cried. It was a very sad situation. But Why, why do you think you cried? I cried, I, I, can, I can remember two times, I'll cry now. <laughs> One was when the beginning of the trial, when the, I don't know if it was the Capitol Police Office, probably the FBI was showing us videos that I'd never seen before of inside. Obviously they wanted this reaction. Of the pandemonium inside, which we've all seen on TV, they had more video than I've ever seen before, of course. And it was just heartbreaking. And the other time was when um, William Isaacs was being tormented by his own attorney. It, it was heartbreaking to watch this poor young man being yelled at and interrupted by his own attorney and not being, and something he needed was being put in front of him and told he couldn't wear it. It was, it was awful. This is insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but what was your reaction when he got COVID at the very end and had to come into the trial via Zoom? Okay, we were brought in and we saw that, and I kept thinking in my mind at some point in this trial, some of these people are gonna try to plead out because this isn't going well. And I really felt somebody was gonna plea, take a plea I mean, I just thought it was insane that they let us have this many counts against them with this much voluminous evidence. So when we first walked in and I saw him on the screen, I'm like, oh, I guess it's him that's taking a plea. I don't know why it made me think that. But then when the judge said he had COVID, the only thought in my mind was, is he alone in that hotel room without his lawyers who were sitting right here in front of us and finding out that he was convicted of seven crimes. I, I, I couldn't get past that. Is there somebody with him? I mean, he, when he was in during the trial, was almost collapsing on the floor. Every time there was a video shown that he was in, he was almost on the floor. That's how upset he was. He put his head down on his desk all the time? He put his head down, but there were times he almost yeah. hit the floor with it. He was literally almost on the floor trying to escape this whole situation. You could understand that. Did it matter when he told you that his aunt, Tracy, I think was her name, drove him to Washington, and that's how he got involved in the whole thing in the first place? Oh, that killed us. And my question, which I would love somebody to tell me to this day, is why wasn't she with him in the Capitol? How was he there without her? None of us were a big fan of Aunt Tracy, but the... You know, the defense tried to blame everything on her. I'd like to know, A, you know, why wasn't she with, with her nephew in the Capitol? And B, has she been charged with anything? I don't know. But yeah, she was a villain in this whole situation. But yet, I'm sorry, um, you know, there were tweets and things that he said that were very vicious. I, he said trying to please his aunt. But to say that you wanna kill Mayor Bowser? I don't think that's very kind. And he was so proud of when he got in. He's taking selfies. And um, his demeanor of what we could see of being in the Capitol 
he's waving on everybody, come on this way. Like, I don't know. Um, I can understand that he may think differently than other people, but so does everybody think differently than other people. You know what I mean? Some other charges, destruction of government property. That was a very, very difficult fight in the jury. We had somebody from the Capitol, architect of the Capitol's office who explained in great detail what there were two sets of doors. There's the Columbus doors and then there's the Rotunda doors. There's two doors that are inside the east entrance of the Capitol, which is where they went in, the glass broke. But then there's these ornamental doors that are hundreds of years old that have carvings in them. This is the entrance, as you know, that um, during a lot of rivals go in there, I think, during the State of the Union and during dignitaries coming to talk to Congress. This is a very ceremonial door. The door is gorgeous. The door is expensive. The door is an antique. The door is precious. The door was almost destroyed. There was so much damage done to it by this mob pressing in to get inside. Can you imagine the weight on like an antique door of hundreds and hundreds of people trying to go in five people at a time, not just one dignitary walking in the door like the President of the United States. No, it was a mob pushing to these doors. So not only was the inside glass broken, but the ornamental doors were destroyed, not destroyed, I'm sorry, damaged really badly. So the half of our jury did not understand, kept, well, there was a, it's one or two people on the jury who kept saying the doors were already broken when they got up the stairs. They're talking about the glass. And I, I would say, you know, over and over again, and a few other people were saying the same thing, you have people carrying flags, wearing gear, you know, with shields on, in mass pushing and rubbing against this, the ornamental doors that were v the really expensive ones with all these carvings, and it's all being scraped. And they, they, didn't, they didn't buy it over and over again. The doors were already broken when they got there. They were like, no, they're part of the mob going in and, and, and you know, damaging the door. We finally were able to convince everybody, but it was really hard. They just didn't understand what we were talking For about. For the record, the government yeah. says, the architect of the Capitol, that $2.8 million in damage has been done to the Capitol. I, I did sit through a sentencing yeah. where the person who was sentenced had a $2,000 restitution that they had to pay back to the government. So they're making these, uh, once they are convicted and right. sentenced, pay back some money. Right, our people were only at the East Door. It was nothing else evident, but yes, somebody needs to pay for that, the damage to that door. And they, we actually finally were able to get a freeze frame of one of the videos, because a lot of the government evidence had our group circled as, as they're going through everything. And we saw their hands their hands touched the doors, that's all we needed. When we finally were able to freeze that, that's their hand, that's their hand, that's their hand, then they were able to say they were involved. What did you think, now that the trial is over, of the media coverage you were able to see afterwards? Um, we weren't, of course, allowed to w look at any media while we were in it, so we didn't know what was going on. Our trial was completely being overshadowed by the Proud Boys trial taking place in the same courtroom at the same time, which is still going on. Same court, not the same, same I'm sorry, the same courthouse. Yeah, down the hallway. Down the hallway was the Proud Boys, a really big trial, I think, with some of their leaders. Ours is the third in a series of Oath Keeper trials. So there were a lot of coverage about the very first Oath Keeper trial, which had the, the top leadership, and then there was a second one, a little less coverage. And I think ours was just like, oh, whatever, there's another Oath Keeper trial. Until we came up with the verdict, uh, the verdicts, I don't think there was much, except I have found in the hometown newspapers and TV stations of a lot of our defendants, they are, of course, front page news, just talking about their person or the couple from their town. But the national media, I think they got very excited when the verdicts came out because there were so many, and the fact that these are the foot soldiers, these are not the leaders, you know, and they still got, you know, mostly, mostly there were, convicted. There was, I was outside 
as you know, you were inside. There was almost no coverage of the trial while it was going on. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. one day I saw like a, I think there was a CNN camera out there, but I don't know what they were doing there. They were looking for us, that's for sure. Well, the camera outside of the court, which I thought was interesting, is a network pool camera. Yeah. It switches every day, it's almost <laughs> never used. Uh, but it's always there every Just day. in case. Yeah. It, was that on the Third Street side or on the third court? Street side. See, I, yeah. we didn't go in and out that way. We all went out the courtroom door because it was closer to the metro. So we, we, I saw that Michael Green was interviewed as he left the courthouse on the Third Street side. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us didn't go out that way, so we never would have seen the media anyway. Another, um, Sandra Parker was convicted of obstructing uh, police officers. Yeah. And, I mean, she's the only one that had that charge. No. Well, that's what I, no, what no, I, no, no. That's what I read them. from the Justice Department, not from... Uh, Some, I, something's just not right. <sighs> no, William Isaacs had a separate charge of, of, distru of interfering with a police officer because when he, he was in the front of our substack line, and we saw him actually put hands what, what on the cop. What do you mean by a substack line? Okay, so the Oath Keepers were, as you probably saw in the videos of coverage of um, the insurrection, were the people who looked like they were in military gear in single file with their hands on top of the shoulder of the person in front of them who moved up the east steps of the Capitol. And that's called like a military substack line or something. William Isaac says he was told because he's a big guy to go to the front of the line, which he regrets now, he says. And because of that, the doors weren't even open when he got to the front. He was part of the heave-ho to get the doors open. But there was a police officer, one, one of two police officers trying to stop this, this mob scene, who we saw he actually had physical hands on. So everyone that went inside, from our the four defendants that went inside, all were convicted of interfering with a police officer, but he got an extra one of those because the four we felt were guilty because as they're approaching the Senate door, there were riot police there that they're pushing and pushing against to get to the Senate door. They're interfering with people trying to calm a crowd during a civil uprising. William Isaacs had a separate one, he had two. So I'm not sure what you're seeing. I'll come back to all this, but uh, Alan, you've worked your whole life in television, <laughs> CNN, C-SPAN. What did you think of the incredible amount of video that you were forced to watch? It, it, was, it was unbelievable how much video evidence they have, and it's not just the CCTV cameras inside the Capitol, which have no audio, and they're like way up here or outside, and they're overhead, and they give you the big perspective, but there's no audio. The amount of video that the FBI gathered from people's phones, from Facebook, from journalists, made the case. We have people in the Oath Keepers who provided us video to convict Oath Keepers. I mean, these people were putting it on their Facebook pages. The amount of work they must have done to gather this video was absolutely overwhelming. I, I, just, I just couldn't even believe it. And of course, the fact that they were able to then, from their phones, get their, their, um, their chats and their texts and their tweets and their... It was just a, 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 such an overwhelming amount of evidence. What did you think of that as an American citizen that lives under the Constitution? and all the different protections we have. I'm frankly glad that they can't get the, they couldn't get the content of their phone calls that would probably require the NSA. It's a very good protection. Of course, it hurt us because it would have been much easier to convict people if we had their phone calls, but you can't have that. But I think if you are a citizen taking videos and posting it on Facebook, you're putting it out there, you know? Um, what about the tweets? I mean, you had Telegram, which is a, you know, like uh, the chats, the, tweets and all that. And they had chats going on chat groups with these people. Um, was that hard to keep track of? Oh, God, yes. Um, I mean, just to know, sometimes you'd have only the phone number and then there'd be all these chat groups, signal groups, 
that are their signal groups where they could create them and then the, our group kept changing which chat were there and one day it was the Florida DC January 6 something and then it would be the DC ops and then it would be DC ops Intel, uh, Intel then it would be the DC ops leadership Intel it was it was absolutely impossible to keep track of it and then this is the thing I cannot believe like Michael Green for example was part of like 10 of these chat groups but he claims he never read a single message <laughs> That was his defense. But wait, wait, wait. This is the thing. When the government, the, the FBI gets all this material, and get ready for this, if it says at the bottom of a, if someone had back and forth conversations, 20 different messages um, that were unread, if they read the last one, it says all of them were read, and it doesn't say when. It doesn't give you a date. I know with email here, if I send you an email, I can set it so it says, oh, Brian read your email at 2 o'clock today. They can't get that with these chats to know when the person read it. So you don't know if they read it as they're marching towards the Capitol or they read it a week later when they were bored. And that's, it's, it boggles my mind in this day and age. How can you not know when someone read something? So that was hard. We've talked about William Isaacs, Connie Meggs, Benny Parker, his wife Sandra Parker. Yeah. You mentioned Michael Green, and the one you haven't mentioned is Laura Steele, who's a former policewoman. Okay. Laura Steele, we were just fascinated by the fact that her lawyer decided not to put on a case. He did an opening statement, and we never heard from him again. Um, two of them didn't put on cases, but... Wait, wait, I'm, I'm getting mixed up. They didn't, they didn't put on a case at all. They did nothing. He didn't even cross-examine any of the prosecution witnesses. And he sat back in the back of the room, I'll never forget this, facing the jury, and he laughed through most of the trial. He was laughing. He was joking, either with the defendant or he had some assistant woman sitting there, I don't know who she was. And he was literally laughing, and it really bothered me like crazy. So w w watching the human beings in that room did have an impact on you? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. But having somebody laugh through a trial where someone's being charged with felonies, I, I, I just was horrified. And then he got up and jokingly said in his closing, oh, you probably don't even remember me. His whole attitude was, my client did nothing, there's no evidence, we're going to sit back here and just hang out. So we, I kept wondering where she was in this whole lineup. In fact, the first day of the trial, a lot of us didn't even know who the defendants were when the prosecution did their opening. We thought Jessica was also, a, we thought there were seven defendants, but we only knew there were six. It took me over a day to figure out who our six defendants were. It was that bad. Laura just sat in the shadows. We couldn't even see her. She was blocked by other people. And her lawyers sat there laughing. That was our impression of her. And there wasn't that much evidence about her, but what we had was pretty damning. Um, what I since found out, which amazed me after being able to finally read about what's going on after our trial ended, her brother was a senior leader of the Oath Keepers. He pled out last year, one of the very first people, to one felony. He did way worse stuff than her. His sister goes to trial and is convicted 100% of everything she's charged with. What does it mean to you to plead out that if you're facing like six felonies or something, you can make a deal with the government and take a plea and, and they'll probably convict you of one charge. You, you plead guilty like one charge. And then you could become a, pros a, a cooperating witness if you want to you know, build some sympathy and help, help cooperate with the government. Then the judge could t take that into consideration at your sentence that you helped them with other trials. And that's one of the reasons people do it. I could not believe that the people in our trial were obviously advised, I assume, not to take a plea and allowed them to be exposed to six or seven, you know, up to, up to six felonies. I, I don't know how a lawyer would let a client take a risk like that. At, at what point in this trial that went on? <laughs> Forever. For, I mean, the whole package was six weeks <clears throat> from the selection of the jury to the, to the deliberation. What, at what point had you made up your mind about most of them? Um, 
you really couldn't until the def you know the prosecution case was the majority of our time. You really couldn't until you heard the defense put on a case if they put on a case. You needed to hear the other side of it. Explain w w what the prosecution's all about and why they put on a, a, much more, a much longer case than the defense. The prosecution's job is to prove that a crime was committed, to prove that these defendants are guilty. It is not the defendant or the defense's job to prove that they're innocent. The prosecutor has to tell you why they're in trial. Why were they charged? What is their case? In a case like this, they had probably at least 600 pieces of evidence. Like I was saying, videos, still pictures, texts, tweets, chats, Facebook. I mean, there was so much information. Oh, lists of phone calls. The log of all the phone calls you made over a day. I mean, they had all this stuff. And they're trying to build as strong a case as possible it's, it's their witnesses they bring, and the defense can cross-examine their witnesses. And so the prosecution case is usually, I think, the majority of the time you're in trial. So of course, as it's building and building and building and building, you think, oh my god, these people are guilty. But you don't know what the other side of it is. You have to hear the other side. You have to hear you know, something that's going to sway you, or you have, to, you have to keep an open mind. Did you have a different feeling in your own situation about all that. I mean, you say you went into it very nervous and you felt the pressure and the significance of it. Did that change during that time that you were on the jury? I'm not sure what you're saying. Did the pressure change? Did the... Well, did, did, did you, <laughs> I mean, did you feel, did you start to feel more relaxed about it or were you more tense about it? Um, yeah, the initial terror, which was just overwhelming the first day when we couldn't even understand what we were doing there well you know how did we how did I get picked and what am I supposed to be writing down was a little overwhelming the confidence built up as you know the case went on because you realize what your role is here and what you're doing and what you're understanding it did it did settle down again but yet there were many sleepless nights throughout the whole thing just the weight of this trial was humongous what these people are here for, what happened. But more than anything, it's like the fate of six human beings, six citizens of this country are on our shoulders, nobody else's. We're not lawyers, we weren't trained for this, and we're gonna decide. You know, I've never been on a jury before, so it was very heavy. We had six defendants and we are deciding the future, possibly the future of their lives. Is that good or bad? It's horrible. Who are we to decide this person's fate? I'm, I just, I, I think it's too big a responsibility. I'm sorry. If the same thing ever happened to you, yeah. would you, and you had a choice, would you pick a judge, what they call a bench trial, with just the judge making the decision, or a jury? 100% a bench trial. I would never want my fate in the hands of people who are mostly completely ill-equipped to understand what's going on and have as any, any human being does, their own biases, their own feelings, their own experiences, their own lives. Why are they deciding it when the judge knows the law? He's seen a million other cases. You know what I mean? He, I, I would want an educated legal expert deciding it, not some random people who could be anybody, you know, off the streets of Washington, D.C., myself included. I want to go through the selection process of the jurors, but I also want to ask you this. The, I've had enough chats in the hallways with the defense attorneys to know and watch the voir dire of uh, several <laughs> juries to know that the biggest concern on the part of the defense attorneys is the fact that this is a liberal town. And so as they went through the voir dire, the questions often were about what are your politics? What do you think of Black Lives Matter? What do you think of Antifa? What do you think of the Proud Boys? What do you think of the Oath Keepers? Right. And the defense attorneys will all tell you they think they have an unfair situation, that the, that the jury is biased. So with that, that preface, what is, what is your reaction looking at it from the other side? I was shocked beyond belief that I was chosen. <laughs> um, I think, I don't know where to begin. They started with 250 people. I don't know if you want to know this much detail. I do, yeah. Uh, okay. 
The jury pool was 250 people. How did you get notified? I got a summons in the mail in December that was filled with pages of information, none of, a lot of which I weren't answering the questions I needed to know. But there was all this information saying, you've been selected for this special federal trial. The word special was in there, and I thought, I know what this is immediately. <laughs> I mean, what else would it be? And that we had to make an appearance mid-January to come in for, well, first of all, let me back up a second. The, the, we had to go online and fill out a basic questionnaire. The basics they wanted to know right away were um, who we are, but the most important thing is if you have paid travel plans or some kind of an illness or you're over a certain age, I don't know, 75 or something, you can get out of it right away. Okay, they wanted to be able to do that first. Then they said we had to come to court mid-January for further screening, which none of us knew what that meant, but it was basically um, a, I'd say a hundred page questionnaire that took an hour and a half to two hours to fill out. There were 250 of us sitting in a courtroom and had to fill out this questionnaire. And that would further, you know, reduce the amount of people um, in, the, in the pool. I had so many problems with that questionnaire. The main thing to me, that I, personally to me, was that they asked you what you did for a living. And I told them I have a part-time job, whatever. They didn't ask you what you did for the prior 30 years of your career, never asked. They only wanted to know if you were a police officer or a lawyer, worked in Congress, worked in the White House, um, you know, that kind of thing. That's all they cared about career-wise, okay. And then it went on and on, have you heard of this, have you heard of that, whatever, you know, it was like, it was pretty easy to answer and I'm like, why aren't they asking me what I was doing for a living two years ago? You know, it just made no sense to me. Working at C-SPAN. Yes, and, and CNN prior to that. Like, why didn't they want to know that? I guess not. Um, anyway, we filled out this questionnaire, and then we were supposed to start jury selection February 1st. That's when we were supposed to start. So for me, with a part-time job, I had to clear my calendar starting February 1st. It's what it said. However, what I later found out is from that 250 pool, we were down to 150. So then voir dire was supposed to start. And voir dire is when they would bring us in 16 people in a group in the morning and 16 in the afternoon and one by one bring us into the courtroom and the judge and the lawyers could ask us questions in order to further whittle down the group. However, nothing started on the first. We were supposed to call in after five every night and find out if you're in need of the next day. So I'm calling in on the 31st, I'm calling on the 1st, calling on the 2nd. I'm like, what is happening? He kept saying, you're not needed tomorrow. And I'm like, where is this big high profile jury? I call, I of course, being me, called the clerk's office, the jury office, and said, what is happening here? You know, my bosses are trying to schedule me and I, I don't know what I'm doing. And they're like, oh, just keep, you know, there, it, there's been a slight delay, just keep calling every night. You'll find out when you're coming in. I'm like, what's this slight delay? I later found out, way later, that they had to have a special, well, they had to have a discussion of how these, you know, 18 lawyers were gonna fit around a table. They didn't wanna be sit around a table. There was a big fight about that. I found that out later after the trial. And then there was the, are we gonna discuss autism? Are we are gonna bring the autism experts in? So that delayed us a few days. So when it started on a Friday, I was told to come in on a Monday, finally. So it was like a week later and I, had, I lost a whole week of work. I came in for the voir dire with my group of 16 and then I went in and I, I don't think you were you were there for that but I got questioned and you you want to hear more about what they asked me yeah I want to oh. I do want to tell our listeners that you and I never talked before or any time during the trial until the whole thing was over two days ago and you couldn't talk to me and I couldn't talk to you. We didn't communicate at all. At all. But I must say, I will tell you this, <laughs> that when I eventually saw you on the jury, I thought I had hoped that we could have this discussion one day. So I just want the audience to know that. But go ahead with the uh, the situation when you were voir dired. So I was voir dired and um, the judge did most of the questioning. And I felt going into this, I need to let them know I worked for C-SPAN. I said, they didn't ask. It wasn't in the questionnaire. I think they need to know this. I don't want it to cause trouble later to look like I was hiding it even though I was never asked. And so I thought, I, it's my job, my responsibility to inform them. So the judge is asking me questions and he gets this one, one of my answers saying, oh, you said you've been inside the Capitol. And that was the question. 
instead of just saying yes or sure, who hasn't, I said, oh yes, I worked right across the street at C-SPAN. With that, three of the defense lawyers jumped to their feet. I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to be cut from this jury. There's no question. And they asked me questions. One, one of the, the first one said, how long did you work at C-SPAN? And I said, 32 years. And like, why does she care? Anyway, but then the, the key question came from the next lawyer who said, were you working for C-SPAN on January 6th? <laughs> and I was like, yes, but I was teleworking. I wasn't working on any of our congressional coverage, and I had nothing to do with it. And so that satisfied him. And then the third thing was like, so like how involved was I in politics or whatever. Um, but it's like I felt like that's it. I'm not going to be on this jury. How could they allow a person from the media who their staff was in the middle of the insurrection and various television equipment was being destroyed from other networks. It could have been ours. I don't even know if it was or wasn't. How could they let this person on the jury? So I thought, that's it. I t after that, I told everyone, all right, that's it. I'm out. You know, there's did, no did chance. Did you want to be on the jury? Yes, I did. When did you make that decision? When I got the summons. <laughs> right away. And why did you react that way? Because, this is going to sound strange, I've always wanted to be on a jury my whole life. I've been on a grand jury, but I thought it would be really interesting and important and just fascinating to be on a jury ever. And I've been called for jury duty my whole life, New York City, two counties in Maryland, D.C., never been picked. Usually never even have to show up. They cancel you the night before. And so not only did I always want the experience, when I realized what this was, I thought this is an awesome responsibility. I want to know how these trials work. I want to know what goes on. You know, I, I want to be part of it. I want, to, I want to experience what it's like to be in a jury on a really important trial or any trial. So I was telling everybody, I'm out. They do not want a journalist on this, on this. The defense will never want a journalist who, you know, whose company was involved in the coverage to be part of this. So I thought I was done. And then I found out while I was waiting to be dared a lot of information from there was somebody babysitting us, a court clerk who wasn't part of our trial, but she had a lot of information. That's how I found out a lot of this. I went from 250 to 150 and um, what was going on. She was very informed. I said, how large does the qualified jury pool have to be? Because I Googled that. Like, wh wh what are we getting towards here? Some, tri some trials, you need 60 qualified jurors to pick from, and some you need 45. We were 45. And since I was in Group A when I got my summons, I don't think they went through the all 150 people with Vadir. It would have taken weeks. I think once they got to 45, they stopped. So because I was in Group A, I got to go. So then we find out there's 45 of us, and we have to come. This is where your part comes. We have to show up for court at 9.30 on a Thursday. And there's 45 of us. We're all given a number. I think this is when I, I probably saw you. Yeah, the, 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 what was it the day before? I, I don't know. There was a whole group that came in, and I was sitting in the back row. But I was right in front of you, remember? Yeah. But the, oh, I do. Yeah. yeah, so I go in, and I, I'm sitting there shaking like a leaf, because I, I can't believe I'm down to 45, because the odds are growing now. I thought there was like a 2% chance I'd be on this jury. Now we're up to like, oh my god, I have like a 20% chance of being on this jury. So I'm nervous, and I just for some reason turned around. And sitting right behind me is Brian Lamb. And you didn't recognize me at first, so I took my mask off. And you went like this, and I went like this. And that's the only communication we had for the next six weeks. But not that you were there, but you happened to be the day, the, there the day I got picked, and I happened to be sitting directly in front of you. Like, what are the odds, right? No, that's just, <laughs> well, and there were, and none of these trials that I've been sitting in are there very many people. I know. The, the, the room is often six people sitting there and no one's there and I'm sitting there by myself and all of a sudden of all people Ellen is sitting in front of me after uh, you, you know this whole process but beyond that then yes what happened after? okay so this is this is it then they told they told us which row to sit in they, they had there's 45 of us they took 16 people and put 12 of them in the jury box and like four people in front of them they had 16 people already seated and I turned to someone I was with another prospective juror and I said I guess we're done they were like no 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 and then they had the rest of us from the 45 sit in rows I was in the front row and I realized the people I'm sitting with are the same people I did my voir dire with the group I've always been with so I thought they were doing it by the groups of how we came I didn't know how they were doing it 
And then for the first of many, many times for the next six weeks, there was a husher sound put over the room. And Explain that. If you watch a trial like in a movie or something or on TV, when the judge wants to talk to the two lawyers, the defense and the prosecution, they come up to the, the judge's desk and they talk. That can't happen when you have 15 different lawyers in the room or whatever we had, um, 13. 13 different lawyers cannot all rush up to the front to talk to the judge. So in order for them to have their little bench conferences or discussions of issues during the trial, they put this big husher sound to, on the room, in, you know, in the room so that you couldn't hear what they were saying and they all got on portable telephones. This went on and on throughout the whole trial, like throughout the whole day, over and over and over again, so that they could, they all had like objections or things to talk about or whatever issues they had questions for the judge, and so they, we couldn't hear it. And they call them sidebars. Sidebars, okay. So they're called sidebars, I never knew that. Okay, so when the six team were in the box, the rest of us in the audience, they get on a sidebar. But what was happening during it, I, I'm sure you probably saw it, the defense lawyers are running back and forth to talk to each other. There was a lot of running back and forth, running back and forth. And then they ran over to the prosecution. Then they went, ran back and the judge is on the phone and they're all on the phone. It's a lot of movement. I'm like, what is happening here? It was like, it was like chaos. And the defense attorneys aren't necessarily always on the same side. Right, because they had different interests for their different, their different clients. So that went on, it seemed like a long time. I don't know how long it was, but it was a long time of them doing this. So what, it, what really was happening in hindsight is that they, these are the 16, I don't know how these 16 got picked to begin with, but now they're raising objections. So I don't know what the process was of how these 16 were the original thinking. Did they agree on this? Did they not? Because it seemed like for the first time, the defense and prosecutors were reacting to those 16 and going crazy. I don't know how they well, got they, to that and point. They, and there's 16 because four are all alternates. Alter, are going to eventually be alternates or will be cut along the way because somebody will get sick or somebody will have an issue or somebody will do something wrong. So what the husher sound goes off, everybody sits down, and then <laughs> the judge says to two of the people already sitting in the jury box, person number four and person number one, stand up and go sit in the audience. And he says, I want the two, <laughs> these two people whose numbers I'll call out to come and sit. And he calls out my number. And I, I almost fainted. I stood up and I almost blacked out because I thought, oh my God, what is happening? So the woman sitting next to me became number one, juror and I became number four. And then they did it one more time with a, a, replacing somebody with a guy who we came to know later. Um, so three people were replaced, and as I'm overwhelmed with shock, I, I, I didn't, I just thought I was dreaming. I could not believe what was happening. As we're told to stand up and go to the jury room because the judge wants to talk to us, one of the defense lawyers stands up and says, I object to two of those jurors. And I believe, I, I don't know if it was me or not. I thought it might have been me and another young woman, but I don't know. And then you're on the jury and yeah. things start right away. Uh, but then a day or so later, I come back. It may not have been a day or so because time just really gets confused. Yeah. And I looked out to the jury and there was no one sitting next to you. I know. That surprised me too. What happened? What happened was a very nice gentleman was sitting next to me. I and mean, everybody's trying to make friends right away because we're in this together and we're all terrified. And this very nice guy sitting next to me on the first day because the judge gave us a five minute speech and then we, the trial started. That's how little time we had to recover from our shock. So sitting next to me that very first day is this very nice man and he's saying to me, I cannot be here. I cannot survive six weeks without a salary. He said, I, I can't do this. And I'm thinking, why didn't this come up sooner? I mean, I guess he could have, I mean, to me, if that was my situation, I would have said it during voir dire. I would have turned to the judge and said, and say that. Just throw yourself at his mercy. Why are you waiting till you got picked? Because he said he never thought he'd be picked. Well, I felt, we all felt that. By the way, people did do that during the voir dire. Oh, sure. You weren't there. Yeah. I saw it. And they, judge said, okay, fine, goodbye. I know. That's your, yes, your one-on-one -on -one with the judge. You tell him anything you can. If there were 45 qualified people, you don't have to stay, you know, but whatever. So he said... He's talking to his boss. 
he's going to call him one more time and see if he could get paid. And then he found out his boss, he told me later, his boss says he can't get paid. There's nothing he could do. And the last thing this man said to me is, I'm going to have my boss call the judge. And I'm thinking, well, good luck with that. You know, that's never going to happen. <laughs> and he, but he was desperate. This man, your, my heart was breaking like, what, you know. And all I know is I walked in the next day and I had nobody, he wasn't there. I had nobody next to me. And the judge says, um, I, I don't remember everything that you do, Brian, but I remember something about, as you can see, one of the jurors was excused. I, there was no explanation. Then there was another juror. <laughs> the, the woman, yeah. That was left. released. And, and how did that happen? That was just wild. She, the, this woman who was on the jury lasted a week. And exactly one week after we started, she was dismissed. Um, she just, it just felt like she was breaking every possible, but she wanted to be there. I must say, I got to know her, and I don't think she was doing this deliberately. I just think it was her personality that whatever the judge told us not to, not, not whatever, but some things the judge told us not to do, like because there wasn't enough room in the jury box for all 15 of us at that time, two people sat on the floor in front of the jury box, just steps away from the prosecution, and right in the path of where the witnesses had to cross over her to get to the witness stand. And she was talking to people. It's like the judges, you cannot talk, not only to each other about the case, but you can't say a word to the defense, the, the defendants, the prosecutors, the witness, you can't talk to them. That was like the absolute most basic law. She was talking to them. And it's like, what, what could be more clear? I heard, and I've heard since I, even talk to you about this, Brian, because I'm ta still talking to the other jurors because we're still, you know, decompressing from this, so we're still talking. Not only did she compliment the shoes of a witness who was walking in front of her to take the stand, she said happy birthday to one of the prosecutors. <laughs> and I didn't hear any of that. All I know is that um, whenever the they had a sidebar and they put that big husher thing on the room and we just sat there silently reading our notes we could check our they let us check our phones if we want to see if we had any messages whatever but we didn't talk she would not stop talking to the woman next to her she wouldn't shut up inches away from the prosecution what is she talking about what is she doing so i think he gave her a week and uh she was she was cut loose by the way small thing when you're sitting on the jury and yeah. they put it's a hiss sound yeah, it's a hiss so that you can't, can't hear, hear them talking the judge talking to the d attorneys mm -hmm. could you hear the attorneys Oh no, we couldn't hear anything. It was very loud. In the uh, oath, in the Proud Boys trial, there are some attorneys that had talked too loud, and the judge has to uh, calm them down. I've seen them raise the level of the hiss at times, <laughs> but I, I I was in the front row center of the jury box, so I'm very close to the prosecution. I could have touched, you know, shook, shaken hands with them. I could not hear a word that was being said, but most people were, I think, speaking pretty. Loud, uh, softly, maybe the defense lawyers were louder, but they were really far away from us. So go back to the time that you deliberated. Oh God! Um, w what was the demeanor of the jury oh. in, the, in the deliberation? You're sighing. Oh, it was it was really, 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 really difficult. Um, we were in a courtroom. First of all, we weren't in a jury room. We were in a courtroom. Side, so, side by side to the your, yes. your, the courtroom that had the trial in it. Fortunately, they let us do that because we were going to be there for six weeks and we could spread out, you know. So there were two rectangular tables. There wasn't one big table, which now I know why they have those. So we were divided in half, and there were literally one or two people sitting with their back to my table the entire deliberation. They didn't even turn around. Um... There was a lot of chitter chatter going on at one table that we couldn't hear. This is none of this should have happened. We should have been all talking as a group. We needed to be on the outside of a big table so we could see each other and hear each other. That never happened. There was constant, you know, we're looking at a piece of evidence and they're over, some people are over there chit chatting. Like, we're like, hello, do you want to look at this with us? You know, it was, it was that almost all the time. It was very hard to have a um, just a conversation <laughs> with all of them. with all of them so people were not hearing what people were saying 
and there was a lot of muttering going on. If you said something and you hear mutter, 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 like, what? What is happening in here? So my overall assessment is that there were a few people in that room who had no idea what happened and did not listen to the trial. And there was a, a block of about four people who were all voting together. There was a block listening to one person who wasn't completely understanding what was happening in the trial. Following everything that that one person had to say. The person, that they, their leader, was one of the two people I saw fall asleep during the trial occasionally. And that was their leader. Um, there were strong opinions. Some people did bring some personal values and views into the room, which they shouldn't have. And all I can say is, forever, thank God, there was an attorney <laughs> who worked in the Justice Department on the jury. How that was allowed, I'll never know. He couldn't believe it. What was the makeup of the jury? Uh, black, white, male, female. When we eventually got down to the 12, after two, two of the 14 were dismissed to give us 12. We never knew who was an alternate, first of all, until the day we got the, the case. They don't want the alternates not paying attention. So once we lost the original two jurors, there were, 16, there were 14 of us. The day the case was over, two male, men were dismissed leaving a, tr a group of 12. And let me just explain, one of those two men had to be dismissed because he had a flight to London four days later and they still let him be on the jury. So he was never gonna be in the deliberating jury. So he and another man who didn't wanna be there at all, both were dismissed. That left us 12. All right. So, so you were at 12, which you needed. We needed 12. And you, if somebody dropped out after that, it was over. If one of us got sick while we were deliberating, the, everyone was, else was gone, but I believe it, just in my own thoughts that perhaps they would let 11 people deliberate? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, the two men that were cut on the last day, they told them, how can we contact you? And one of them's like, I'll be in London, you know, I'll be, you know, forget it. And the other one was in DC. So there was one of the alternates who was able to, would be called back, I think is what they, because they said, before you leave, we need your cell phone numbers. Those are the two alternates as they were leaving. So one would have been in the United States. He probably would have been called. Anyway. Oh, there was one day that, um, you know, a juror had a family emergency. We didn't come in to deliberate, you know. You unless didn't come in at all. I remember no, that day. Yes. It was, unfortunately, it was a Friday when we have half a day. They, we just didn't come in. I mean, God forbid somebody got hit by a car or we got COVID. That would be terrible. And if you got sick one day, we would just wait. So male, female, black, oh. white? <laughs> male, female. It's easier to do. There were fewer males. So there were, um, let me think about this. There were one, two, three, four five males. Let me make sure I got that right. Two, two, and one. Yes, there were five males out of the 12. Black and white. Um, I'm going to count. One, two, four. There were four, four people who were white. Yeah, my, my yeah. take was there were eight African Americans yes. when I sat yes. and watched the... Yes, the majority of our panel were African-American females. I'm not sure you want to go there, but how, what, did race matter in that room? It mattered to a certain extent. I think one of the biggest race effect on this whole case was that Michael Green, Green happened to be an African-American defendant, and he said very, I felt, inflammatory things on the, on the stand, and that had different impacts on people on the jury. I what really, kind of inflammatory things did he say? He was very critical of senior citizen white people, and he made that very clear. He called them all kinds of names because he was saying that you know, I don't want to even I don't even remember everything he said, but he would, his basic um, point was that senior citizen white people can't can't do an insurrection. <laughs> you know, how could these people possibly have pulled it off? But he was saying really not nice things about older people. And then I believe he may have said the N-word once or twice, I think. <laughs> it just felt like there was, there was racially charged information coming out, out, out from him. You know, of course, you can understand that he was originally skeptical of the Oath Keepers because he thought they were white supremacists. He was worried about that. But Why was he there? Did he say? He was hired. He was. He had a lot of experience. He was a, a veteran, and he worked. He worked for Blackwater. He had a lot of private security experience, and 
he was paid. He made good money from the Oath Keepers. He'd done this at other rallies with them. You know, it was, a, it was something he was paid to do. What is, after looking back now on this, what, what do you think an Oath Keeper is? Hi. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a difference between the Proud Boys are all men. I think the Oath Keepers are a lot of former, you know, police and military and first responders um, who I think want to continue in that kind of military structure. They really like it. You know, they like being part of a military, quasi-military group. But I don't, I don't think it's a racially mixed group. I don't think it's a politically mixed group. I think they are on the right. I think they are Trump supporters. I think they are coming with the same politics. And I... I mean, there were people on our jury who thought that the reason the Parkers ha could not come alone to Washington is because they were afraid that D.C. is a, a majority African-American city. That's how the jurors felt. They afraid they were afraid. They had to have contact with African-Americans, and they were afraid of D.C. That's what their, see, that's what their perception of the Parkers were, that they were afraid to come here and possibly, uh, no, I, I shouldn't go any further. That's what they, that's what they thought. Psychological impact on everybody. Meaning the jury, not the... Hope. Well, just from your sense of, uh, I mean, obviously the people that are convicted. Yeah, they're probably in They're not going to be sentenced for a while. No. They don't know. They're not in jail now. They're not going to be in jail until they're sentenced. And they're going to appeal it. Yeah, of course. Who doesn't? And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that anything I say here is not going to be used <laughs> for appeal purposes. I mean, I'm not saying anything I mean, it, that didn't the happen. The audience ought to know it's legal for you to say anything you want right. to after this is and over. And the judge did not give us any restrictions on, on speaking after we left. He didn't say a word about, he said, in fact, I just have to tell you this, if the lawyers on either side, defense or prosecution, want to talk to us, they might want to interview us, they'll go to the court and then the court will contact us. So he was like saying, sure, if you want to, and he never mentioned the media, that's why we're here. Do you have to talk to them if they call you? No, I would. I would definitely talk to them, as you know. I wouldn't hold back. I have a lot to say to those people. But anyway, what was your question? The psychological lost? impact uh, on the jury. You can see what it's done to me. I'm, I'm rambling. I'm just at a, on the jury. Okay, this is something I've come to realize. Since I've been on the jury, I've done research and found there is something that a certain percentage of jurors, after they're done, suffer from PS PTSD, which I can understand. But for me personally, and for a lot of the other jurors, we, there was a lot of sleepless nights. We, we talked about this, I was having nightmares. I would wake up in the middle of the night and it wasn't specific to our trial, our defendants, our judge, our jury, it was, I'm in the US District Court and someone's getting shot in a courtroom. I'm waking up with this. Like, where is this coming from? And it was, there was total disruptive, disruption of sleep. This is, a, like I said, a very heavy burden. But again, I'd wake up in the middle of the night going, oh my God, this is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna say tomorrow to the jury. I felt like, oh my God, I'm, I'm a lawyer in this case. Because we weren't working smoothly together. It was a very difficult dynamic in that room. And something had to break through to these people or we never would have come to agreement on anything. That was my fear. We have 34, we're gonna be here for the rest of our lives. We're not gonna come together on anything. And that, that was almost happening. Um, so I would be waking up in the middle of the night going, oh my God, I have to point this out to them. And then it's like, this is what's on my mind all night long. It was, it was stressful. And now, of course, I'm glad we're doing this interview because I have a whole big bunch of relatives and friends who want to know what happened. And you can see how long it's taking me to tell you what happened. So I'm going to say, watch this podcast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or listen to this podcast. But um, yeah, I know I'm rambling. <laughs> I'm sorry. When you went home at night, yeah. did you write things down? No. I need you didn't. to I needed to frankly put on the TV and watch a movie. I, I had a I couldn't have continued. But to repeat what you said earlier, you could not tell anybody you were in this on this jury. No. What I had to tell my friends and relatives or could tell them is I am on a federal criminal jury and it probably is gonna go six weeks. That was all the judge said we could tell. We could tell people. That was it. And the fact that you're on the jury for me was a happenstance. Yeah, that was a pure a, happenstance. And then I just couldn't believe it. Of all the people, of all the gin joints and all the courts, I turn around and Brian Lamb's sitting next to me as I'm being picked as a juror. 
Yeah, it worked both ways. You had your <laughs> job to do, and I had my job to I do. I know. <clears throat> Have we, is there anything we haven't covered? Oh, God. Um, yes. I mean, these are, this is getting really specific, but when you're a brand new jury on a trial against six defendants that's going to go for six weeks, and you're going to hear 8,000 pieces of evidence, the judge says to you, oh, you can take notes. In some courts, you can't, but we weren't going to get a transcript. Now, I can understand both of those things. And the taking notes was voluntary. You didn't have to. Your memory is what you're supposed to rely on. Yeah, right. But you can't take notes. And we weren't going to get a transcript, which I understand because we would still be reading it. It would take us a month to go through it, you know. But he said, this is the key thing, you will get all the pieces of evidence, all the videos, the pictures, the texts, the tweets, the phone lists, everything. You will have that to review during your deliberations. And with that, you relax a little bit. What he should have said is you also need to write down the number of every single exhibit you're going to hear because, which we didn't do, because they would rattle out a 10 number digit with letters and dots in it every time they showed anything. And I'm like, who's going to write that down? I'm like, they're going to give us the exhibits. We don't have to worry about it. Fortunately, one juror did write down every single number they said. I don't know how she was able to do it that quickly. When they gave us the exhibits during the deliberations, they weren't described. So you would have Caldwell's Facebook and a list of 12 numbers, and you don't know what they are. That's all it said. You don't know what, what it is. It would have been impossible for us to do our jobs if that one juror hadn't written down every single number of every exhibit and what it was. I, I just don't even understand how that, it was luck that we were able to do what we were able to do, and I just felt that was important that if the judge had any question about what my recommendation be, uh, be like. What was your first vote? Uh, In other words, did you have one of those, let's no. all find out? How, no. He told us I wanted to. The judge said, don't do that, and we wouldn't do it. We had to start talking. He said, don't do that. I don't know why. In the movies on TV, they do that, but he told us not to. We didn't. I so don't know. Here's the fi final couple of questions. Um, if a Trump loving, Trump supporting person from out in the country came to you and said, I think our crowd got a bad deal on this. It was in a town that 95% of the people voted Democratic in the last election, that the media tilts to the left and that the jury obviously came from this environment, how could our people get a fair trial? What would you say to them? As a member of a jury in one of these trials, I completely relied 100% on the evidence. I don't care who the person was. I don't care what state they lived in. I don't care who they voted for. And I just was given a job to look at the evidence and be able to make a case about the evidence. And that, that's exactly what I, as a juror, did. You know, I, for example, don't know the politics of one of the defendants. I don't care. I don't care. You know? And what, what rating would you give the quality of lawyers among the prosecutors and then the quality among the defense Oh, attorneys? my God, you are putting me on the spot. I thought the prosecutor. I mean, all right, I thought the prosecutors were excellent. I thought they did a really good job. Now, I don't have much trial experience. You know, I have nothing to compare this to other than maybe I've watched some trials on TV, high profile cases and everything. So I don't know what prosecutors in federal court, you probably know better than me. You've been to other trials. I have nothing to compare these people to. All I know is I think the prosecution was very good. I think they, other than the opening statement went so fast, I didn't even know who the defendants were and I didn't even know who the, what the charges were. I couldn't write that fast. We were in shock. We had just been picked and they were into the opening statements. That was the only criticism I have. I, they need to slow it down and baby us a little bit more in the first five minutes of the trial. So the key information I needed for the next four weeks, I didn't have. What about the defense attorney? I'd say two of the defense attorneys out of how many were there, nine? I was very impressed with. I would hire one of those two if I had to, God forbid, need a defense attorney. 
the others, I just, there was one who in the opening statement insulted us and one who was pandering to us because we were DC jury. The pandering drove me crazy. It's, it was in my notes. He's quoting Michelle Obama to this jury. He's pandering to us. I mean, it just, some of them, these obvious ploys were not necessary. We can see through that. And one of them insulted us by saying, um, these people didn't know what Congress was doing that day. Nobody in America knows what it means to certify an election. I'm like, what are you, out of your mind? Are we idiots? You know, like, you know what I'm saying? So they, they, were, they were not, I don't think all the lawyers knew who they were talking to, but it doesn't matter. The point is, I think two of them were really good. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Ellen, let's leave it all there. Yeah, really. <laughs> And thank you so much for doing this because the main reason to do it was to let the American people who are interested know something about how the system works. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.